My name is Sonia Danoff. I'm a pulmonary doctor, a lung doctor. Oops, maybe I should turn these on. I'm a pulmonary doctor from Johns Hopkins, and I was tasked with telling you about the lung and how the lung can be involved in myositis. And so what I'd like to do is just spend the next sort of 30 minutes or so telling you some things that I think might be helpful. Um, and so what I'd like to do is to talk about what normal lung function is. I'd like to talk about this entity that we call interstitial lung disease, or ILD, and I'll use that short form through most of the talk. And then I want to talk about how we make a diagnosis of interstitial lung disease, or ILD, and, and just a little bit about treatment. Um, but the most important thing is, at any point in time, feel free to stop me and ask questions. What I've tried to do is just kind of give you an overview of a part of this disease which is often not really on, the, on people's radar uh, because it is, tends to be thought of as being a muscle disease. And so let me just start by telling you about the lungs, which you may or may not remember from when you were taking biology in high school or college or whatever. The lungs are actually really simple organs, thank God. Um, they're really made up of only three components. There are the airways, which are these tubes that are the conducting system that brings the air from the mouth down into the lung. There are blood vessels, and the blood vessels are very critical because they bring the blood into the lungs, and the blood needs to carry oxygen out to the tissues. And then finally, there are these very fine structures called air sacs or alveoli. And in that, in that very tiny space, what happens is that the air in the alveolus is brought in very close to the blood vessels where there are these red blood cells. And oxygen actually diffuses or just passes across that membrane. And then it binds to the red blood cells that are in the blood. And the red blood cells carry the, the oxygen out to your tissues. So when everything is working great, you take a breath and the air enters your mouth. It comes down through the trachea and the airways. And the air starts out as a mixture. So it's 21% oxygen, which means about 79% of its other stuff. And that other stuff is not a problem. It's just not useful to your body for the purpose of burning fuel, which is what the oxygen is all about. So one of the critical things that happens here is that oxygen in specific is absorbed from the air. So the other components stay in this airspace. And when you exhale or breathe out, they're just removed from your body through the exhalation. Okay, so not a really complicated system, but a system that's very important to have at work. Okay, so one of the things people often say to me is, well, this is a disease that's called myositis. And so myo refers to muscles. And so why is it a disease of muscles might affect the lung? And so the first question is, does the lung have muscles? And the answer Very important muscles of respiration that can actually be affected by this by the myositis in the same way that the muscles that you use to lift your arms and walk and things like that can be affected. The major muscle is this thing called the diaphragm, and the diaphragm separates the abdominal content from the lungs and in the chest. And every time you breathe, what your body does is it contracts that muscle, and when it contracts the muscle, you breathe in. And then when it relaxes, you breathe out. So it's a very, it's actually a very muscular activity. It's also supported by muscles that run around where the ribs are that help your rib cage rise when you take a big deep breath. So indeed, the muscles of breathing can certainly be affected in myositis. And often what we're trying to do when a patient comes in who's short of breath and has myositis is figure out, is this primarily a muscle disease or is it a disease of the muscle and the lungs? Because the lung can also be injured even though it doesn't contain muscle tissue. And this is one of the um, issues that has come up about how we name things. So when myositis was named, it was named because it's the, the outcome that was noticed is people became weak. Their muscles were, were weak and they were sore. And so it was called myositis. 
But then as we went on, we realized that some people had skin rash also, and so that was called dermatomyositis because it was the skin as well as the muscle. Now, in about the 1970s, we realized that the lung was also involved in this disease, but somehow it never got incorporated into the name. And so although this is called myositis, it can equally and almost more importantly affect the lungs because the lung involvement is often very disabling and unfortunately also is a significant contributor to people's being hospitalized and even dying from this disease. Now, what happens when people develop this consequence of myositis, which we call interstitial lung disease? So it happens when the immune cells are activated, what we call inflammation. So I know that you've heard on a number of occasions here that the immune system was built into the body to protect you from things like viruses and bacteria that are in your environment. And part of what the body is supposed to do, what its immune system is supposed to do, is to differentiate between what's from the outside and potentially dangerous and what's part of you that's always safe. And what we understand is that for reasons that are different in every person, there is a breakdown of that, that ability to differentiate between self and other. And when that happens, the immune system can turn on the self. We call it autoimmunity, which is affecting ourselves. And when that happens, there is this inflammation that takes place in the lungs. And because it's targeted against part of you. It's not like a bacteria that after it's killed and destroyed, it goes away. You stay. So the inflammation keeps going on and on. It doesn't stop itself. And the way the body uses this inflammatory cascade to kill things like bacteria and viruses is actually by releasing very toxic compounds. It's almost like chlorine bleach. And when it happens in a very small area, it can destroy the bacteria or the virus but then it stops, and so the area of the lung that has been damaged by the cleanup efforts, it regenerates itself. The problem is that when this inflammation keeps going and going, it doesn't get ch a chance to heal. It just continues to be injured. And in some cases, when it's injured enough, rather than it being able, to, rather than the lung being able to produce normal cells again, it can't. It actually produces a scar or fibrosis. And that's a point at which the lung is damaged in a way it cannot repair itself. When the lung is just simply in an inflammatory state, it can recover to a normal, healthy lung. But once it hits a point of fibrosis, then it really can't reverse itself. There's no program in the cells to be able to go back from a scar to a normal, healthy lung. Okay, So let me talk a little bit about the impact of interstitial lung disease. So let me just tell you, I pointed out that very um, important space where the alveolus, the air space, is wrapped around by the capillary or the blood vessel where oxygen transfer takes place. So that very tiny space is called the interstitium, where the blood vessel and the air space come together. The term for that is the interstitium. And so what happens is that in a normal lung, you have these blood vessels that essentially wrap around the air spaces, and so there's a very little barrier to transfer of oxygen from the air into the blood. But what happens when you develop a fibrotic or an inflammatory disease is that the area around these air spaces becomes filled with either inflammatory cells or with scar, with fibrosis. And because of that, it actually separates the airspace from the blood vessels, or it completely eliminates that space. And because of that, the capacity of the lung to absorb oxygen is substantially diminished. So when you have the inflammation and scarring, it blocks the transfer of oxygen from the air into the blood. And you need to have that oxygen because the oxygen is necessary to burn fuel in the cells. So if you have a car, and you have a dirty air filter, or you don't have your car tuned properly, what you discover is that the car doesn't work efficiently. efficiently. It burns too much gas, or else it will start to, it'll conk out when you've turned it on. And that's very similar to what's happening at a cellular level in your body. If you don't get enough oxygen to your tissues, like your muscles of your hands or your legs, 
then as you start to exercise and your body needs to burn those fuels, it instead produces something called lactic acid. And that's the same thing that happens like when you were younger, if you used to run, and sometimes you would get a cramp in your leg, that's where the lactic acid is building up. So essentially what happens is that the muscles are using this very inefficient system to burn the fuel because they're not getting enough oxygen. So because of that, it's not just an issue of the lungs, it's really an issue of the body as a whole. The body doesn't function as well because every time you go to exert yourself, the muscles are being starved for their oxygen. Okay, so what kind of symptoms might a person with interstitial lung disease experience? And the first thing I want to say is everybody is different. And I think that one of the things that's been abundantly clear as I've talked with people here is that each person's experience of their disease is very different. And, and I think it's, although we can talk in general about what symptoms are common, it's very different for each person. And I would um, hate to have somebody say, oh, gee, I, I've never had that symptom, so maybe this is not what I have. Or say, well, I have that symptom, but I don't have interstitial lung disease. Maybe there's something wrong here. So these are some of the symptoms. Some of them are shortness of breath. So let's say you're trying to walk up the stairs to go up the hill. You might find yourself short of breath. That happens to other people as well. If your muscles are weak, if, you're, um, if your heart is not good, you might also experience shortness of breath. So there's nothing specific to interstitial lung disease that leads, that would, shortness of breath isn't specific to interstitial lung disease. It can be a symptom of other things. A cough is a very common um, uh, problem that's associated with interstitial lung disease. Some people develop a cough far before they develop any shortness of breath. And in fact, I have many patients who come to me because typically their spouse says, hey, you know, I've noticed my spouse is coughing all the time, and this is something different. The last thing that I hear a lot is that people just feel tired. And for the longest time, we were kind of of the mind that patients with interstitial lung disease would be tired just because they were working harder to breathe. But what we've actually found is that the presence of interstitial lung disease actually increases the risk of a very common problem called obstructive sleep apnea, which is an issue with breathing while you're asleep. So some of the people may be tired because they are just working hard to breathe, but there's also a significant number of patients who we discover have this obstructive sleep apnea. And if we treat it, they feel less tired, which is really the goal of all of this, is to have you have the best life possible. OK, so I've told you a little bit about what interstitial lung disease is. And I've told you about what some of the consequences can be. Now what I want to move on to do is I want to talk about how we make this diagnosis. Because a lot of people have said to me, well, you know, sometimes I'm short of breath. Is it possible that I have interstitial lung disease? Well, it's possible, but the reality is interstitial lung disease is relatively rare, except if you have certain predisposing conditions. And some of you who are here have myositis with an associated antibody that puts you at higher risk. Those tend to be things like the antisynthetase antibodies, Joe, PL7, PL12, EJ, OJ, um, or antibodies like MDA5. And I also heard somebody talk to me about the fact that they had a Rho antibody. We know that some of the patients who have Rho antibody will end up with interstitial lung disease. So the likelihood for people in this room who are affected by myositis is much greater than it would be for people in the average room, but it's not 100%. So certainly not everybody who develops myositis will develop interstitial lung disease. So how do we figure out that a person has it? Well, one thing that we hope your doctor does on a regular basis when they see you is they put a stethoscope on your chest. And when we hear a sound that is we call crackles, then that's something that tunes us into maybe this is some interstitial lung disease. So people ask me, what does crackle sound like? And it's actually the sound of Velcro opening. So if you've ever had a Velcro, a Velcro uh, closure on shoes or anything like that, when you pull it open, you know that makes that kind of crackly sound? That's the sound we're listening for. Now, not everybody who has crackles has interstitial lung disease, and not everybody with interstitial lung disease has crackles. So there are a couple of other ways that we can figure this out. 
We can also look at something that's called a chest x-ray, which is just simply an image of you looking through your chest. Everything appears in black and white, and we can see if the pattern looks normal. We can also do something called a CT scan, and I'm going to show you what those look like on the next slide. The other thing we do quite frequently is something called pulmonary function tests or breathing tests. We also call them PFTs. And pulmonary function tests, which I'm going to talk about in some detail, are a way of measuring in an objective fashion how well your lungs are working and how big they are. And I'll explain why that is, is something that is, is important. Now, I want to just add that in this population of patients who have myositis, it is rarely necessary to have a biopsy done. Some people do. Sometimes it takes a while for, people, for the doctors to figure out what's going on. I've certainly had a number of patients who came to me in my myositis clinic who were diagnosed because they had a biopsy and it looked like the biopsy that's associated with an autoimmune disease. And then the, the, the doctor or the pulmonologist figured out what was going on. But we try to make sure that the way people figure it out is through sending blood tests and doing other tests, not by doing surgical biopsies on the lung. Okay. All right. So let me, I talked about a CT scan. Many of you who have interstitial lung disease have heard about this. I'm showing you these two side by side just to give you an idea of what we're looking for. So this image on, on the left is what a normal lung would look like. And the things that you'll notice, this is at the, 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 um, the place where the trachea breaks into two, the two branches. And so you can see this is the aortic arch. That's the blood vessel coming across the middle. Things that are solid, like bones, are bright white. Things that are filled with air, like the trachea, is black. And you can see the lung is largely black. There are a few of these little white flecks in here. That's actually the interstitium. That's the supporting tissue. And so we can see it, but we can see very little of it in a normal lung. Now, if you compare that to this image, which is a patient who has interstitial lung disease, what you can see is that the bones here are very bright white. And there's some areas of the lungs that are black, but much of the space that is where the lung should be is actually filled with this more white appearing um, uh, component. And the term we use to describe this is ground glass. And that doesn't mean it's glass. I'm sure many of you remember ground glass stoppers you used to have them on old jars and pharmacies and things like that. This was named because it was thought to appear like a ground glass stopper. And what that really is is the imaging equivalent of inflammation in the lung. So if we took a person and we gave them a viral infection, if I, you had influenza and you had a bad pneumonia, it would look like this. So there's nothing that distinguishes the inflammation of myositis from the inflammation of an infection because, in fact, they're really the same thing. It's just that when you have influenza and pneumonia, it tends to go away. And so it gets better over time. Whereas when it's an inflammation related to an autoimmune disease, unless we treat it, it doesn't typically go away. Okay? Any questions? Yes, please. Just the interstitial lung, once the ground glass is there, even if it's like at the beginning stages, it never goes away. No, it can actually. So we definitely, this is something that we'll talk about a little bit more later, but. Many of our patients, if you look at the data on patients with lung involvement in myositis, um, probably a third of patients get better, a third of patients stay about the same, and, and maybe even less than a third decline a little bit in their lung function. But having interstitial lung disease is not an irreversible thing. It definitely is something which is treatable, and actually for many patients, they'll improve compared to where they were when they, we first meet them. So we really consider this to be something which should be treatable in the majority of patients. Okay? That's a good question. Anything, any others in, at this point? Yes, ma'am. I'm curious what that degree thing is on that one. Oh, this is the heart. I'm sorry. This is the heart. And you can see it's, it's more solid than, than the air space. It's got more solid to it, so that's why it looks that gray color. Yeah. No, that's a great question. All right. Um, Earlier today, I was asked about pulmonary function tests. And one of the things that um, you probably heard me say earlier is that you are your own best advocate, OK? Your doctor is there to help you, but you are the person who is primarily responsible for your health care. 
you're the person who remembers to go to your visits, you're the person who remembers to ask the questions. And because of that, you need to know how to read your pulmonary function tests. So when you have pulmonary function tests done, I want you to understand what you're looking at and how to read them and how to compare them over time. So these first two tests called spirometry and lung volumes measure the size of the lungs. This third test called diffusion measures the ability to absorb oxygen from the air, okay? Now, when you look at these, there are a whole bunch of numbers, but what I've done is I have put an arrow on the thing that is really kind of the critical number. It's like everything in the modern world, it's sort of data overload, so you have to kind of hone in on the things that are relevant. So you want to look at your FBC, your total lung capacity, and your diffusive capacity, DLCO, okay? Now, each of these, you're going to see what is an actual. That's what they measured when you did the test. So when they said, blow, 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 you blew out two and a half liters of air, OK? That is next to a column that says predicted. That is based on your age, your height, your gender, and your race. And so you'll see at the top of your test, when you look at your test, if it says that you're six inches shorter than you actually are, you need to tell them to correct that because it's going to screw up your predicted values, okay? Then we look at the percent of predicted, which is the number over here. And as I was saying to people earlier today, pulmonologists are not very complicated people. We like to keep things simple. So we use the same rules for all of these numbers. If it's greater than or equal to 80%, it's normal. If it's between 80 and 65, it's mildly decreased. 65 to 50 is moderately decreased, and below 50 is severely decreased. And that applies to each of these numbers. So this one is 80%. So this person's forced vital capacity is 80%, so it's in the normal range. There's human variation. We're all different. We're all different sizes and shapes. So we say anything up to 80, between 80% 80 and above is normal. So it's not like if you have 80, it's not like you've got a B, and if you've got 90, you've got an A. Everything that's 80 and above is, is just as good. We've got a curve on this data. OK, so when they measured the person's uh, total lung capacity, their total lung capacity is 88%. That's definitely normal. It's above 80, which I told you was the normal cutoff. Now, let's look at this number down here, which is the diffusion capacity, the DLCO. Well, that's only 71%. So we would say this person has a moderate, uh, excuse me, a mild diffusion defect. And that's because that DLCO number is less than 80% of what would be predicted for somebody who's their age and height. Okay? So what does that tell you? Well, what it tells you is that these, the lung sizes are approximately right, but the lung isn't quite as good as it could be in absorbing oxygen. Why might that be? Well, maybe this was a patient who, who smoked cigarettes for some period of time of their life, and they have a little bit of changes related to smoking. Maybe they have interstitial lung disease. Maybe they have some other feature which leads to their lung being less efficient. But that is exactly how we test patients to see, number one, if they do have interstitial lung disease, where they are, and then when we treat them to see if they're getting better. Those are the numbers we're looking at. Let me stop here and just ask if anybody has any questions about that. Well, I've had two of these, and I'm the same way. What does it mean? And even my urologist says, I have no idea what that means. I'm not a pulmonologist. So you so should. I'll, I'll look at my test. Yeah, you should, you should look at everything. And, and the other thing I, I've said earlier today is I would really encourage you, every time you have pulmonary function testing, as part of your ability to advocate for yourself, is get a copy of your test, get a free ring notebook, stick it in your notebook. Similarly, anytime you have a CAT scan, EMG, just stick a copy in there because we have a very portable world. I'm sure many of you vacation in places other than where you live. Having that information is super valuable. If you end up getting sick in another town, hopefully our electronic health records speak to each other, but if they don't, you've got that critical information in your hand. Would you, say, would you say the top two would be more anatomy and the bottom one's function? Nope. So the top two, I, I, get, I hear what you're saying. So the top two are, are, but these are structural issues. So as the lung becomes injured, 
it becomes smaller because the lung is very much like, I like to think of it as being like a kitchen sponge. You know how when your kitchen sponge is moist, you can just squeeze it, but if that kitchen sponge dries out, it turns really hard and brittle, and that's when the lung fibrosis, or when it's very inflamed, it becomes quite stiff. It's hard to, hard to manipulate it. And so, as the lung is damaged by interstitial lung disease, these numbers tend to come down. The lung sizes come down, and because it's affecting this area where oxygen absorption takes place, it also causes the diffusing capacity to come down. Now, I saw a couple of hands. Yes, sir. What was the bottom number of that mild range? Um, 65. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did, uh, yes, ma'am. Did, did you have a question for me? No, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I saw a couple of hands, so I, I got lost. Do you do the um, respiratory muscle weakness? Do you no, respiratory muscle weakness is very important because there's a lot of poor efforts. Oh, so let's talk about let's talk about the quality. And I do I have oh I'm sorry, I think I'm supposed to be doing this also. Pardon me. Does somebody want to run around? Oh. Thank you. Yeah, I so the 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 question was asked was about poor effort. So let me tell you something else about how these are done. So um there is a group called the American Thoracic Society that I'm a member of, and they set standards for what um, pulmonary function testing should look like. So when that PFT tech is yelling at you, blow, 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 what they're trying to do is they're trying to achieve a six second tail on your exhalation. And if you can't push that six seconds out, they're gonna say it's a poor quality study. And it's not because you didn't do your best. I have many patients who can't do that. They don't have enough lung capacity to blow out for that period of time. Or they cough and they can't get that full range. That just is, that's a way of us knowing that, there, that it did not meet ATS criteria. It's not trying to be critical of you. It's actually just trying to tell us whether it met the standard that the ATS has written. The other thing that they're interested in is with the DLCO, this one you only get to try twice. You get to, you take one big breath in, you hold it, you blow it out, you can do that twice, that's all you can do. And if you don't get within 10%, it's also gonna show as being a poor quality study. And again, it just tells us that these numbers are a little wobbly. It may be a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. It's not meant as criticism, it's just meant to allow your doctor to know how much weight do you put on that number. Is that like a solid number, it was, if we did it again, it would look just like that? Or was it that there was some variability and maybe if we tried again tomorrow, it might be a little bit better, a little bit worse? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So I, I don't have interstitial lung disease, but I do have restrictive lung disease. And I have uh, IBM. Mm -hmm. um, so forever I tried to convince somebody that, I, you know, my heart rate's all over the place, I'm lightheaded and dizzy. Anyway, I finally did have a chest x-ray come back and show hyperinflation. So I went, they did the spirometry. I have a reading on my thing that isn't even up here, so I don't know what reason it says minus 34. And oh, I just, that's, you had a NIF or a MIF, yes, something yeah, where you take I a had. breath in. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a very, that's an interesting, and so let me talk about that as well. So, or maybe you wanted to tell me more about that. Oh, well, and, and I have, so I also have a hyperreactive, I have multiple chemical things. <coughs> so sure. there are certain things that trigger. Yeah. And the pulmonologist I'm working with has seemed to kind of blow this off. And yeah. she just asked me, so how should we change your BiPAP readings? And I'm thinking, yeah. heck, I don't know, because sometimes I feel like it's breathing faster than I can breathe. Mm -hmm. So it's just confusing. Sure, and, and you made a great point, which is that I, I focus a little bit on interstitial lung disease, but absolutely, folks who have IBM and many of the other muscle diseases have disease that primarily affects the diaphragm. It makes the diaphragm weak. So the lung itself, these numbers might be normal, but it's still hard to breathe because that diaphragm is maybe usually when the, when the um, diaphragm is affected, these numbers are low, so the lung is restricted, it's small, but, there's, but this diffusing number might be normal because it's not the lung that's the problem, it's actually the, the muscles that are the problem. Now, the test that they did is something called a NIF or a MIP, and that is a negative inspiratory force. So what it is is they probably said to you, take a big breath in. And what they did is they measured the amount of 
pressure you could produce through that deep breath in. And that is a measure of how well your diaphragm is coiled down. So most people can generate about a minus 90 to minus 100 centimeters of water. And so if you are pulling down minus 40, it's not terrible, but it's not normal. Okay? And so there are many other tests that can be done, but in terms of sort of the, the long-term monitoring, this tends to be a pretty common one. Let me just make one other comment about the, the test that MIP or, or, or NIF that you had done. Um, the issue with that test is it actually has a lot of variability in it. And part of the reason it has so much variability is that when you do it, you have to make sure your cheeks are absolutely stiff because you can end up having pressure that is actually um, generated by the diaphragm but it causes your cheeks to come in so it doesn't get transmitted to your mouth. So part of the reason that we don't follow those numbers necessarily over time is because if you have a good test one day, it may look totally different than if you don't have a really good test the next day, even if nothing else has changed. So it's just got more variability in it. So one of the things we often will do is have people do just a forced exhale volume. So, yeah, okay. Um, a forced exhale volume, because that is more reproducible than these MIPs or NIFs. It doesn't mean that there isn't something good from it. It's just, it's not as easy to reproduce day to day. Yeah, well, she did that through in minus 64%. Yeah, so it's a little bit off. I'm sorry, there's a question in the back. How often do you recommend yeah. pulmonary function? So what I usually do is when I meet a person who has interstitial lung disease, I usually check their um, pulmonary function tests three or four times in the first year. And then we get a sense of what is the trajectory here? Is this somebody who's rock solid stable? Is this someone who's slowly dropping down? Is this somebody who's dropping down rapidly? And then in the next 12 month period, we make our decision about the frequency of PFTs based on the first 12 months. Now, does that mean that people don't change trajectory? No, I definitely had people who were rock stable and then something happens and they suddenly drop. But that's why having a good connection to your local doctor is important. Because when something starts to go wrong, don't wait till your next doctor's visit that's scheduled. Call them up and say, hey, you know, I noticed that the things I had been doing a month ago that were easy, I'm now getting out of breath with. I think I need to come back in. And, and I think one of the tests that they might want to do at that stage would be to do some pulmonary function tests. So these can be used as a very nice measure of how things are going for you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I had my pulmonary function tests done relating to asthma. Mm -hmm. Then I got the IBM diagnosis. Quite many years later, yeah. in trying to figure out other issues, mm -hmm. uh, should we be re? I've never, I haven't done another pulmonary function test. Should we be doing more now? Now that we have this new information. I've got yeah. a bunch of stuff other than that going on. Yeah. So so I, I, I said earlier, because you have something unusual, in other words, the myositis, it doesn't mean that you don't have all the normal stuff. So you might still have asthma. But I think that if you have any symptoms that are breathing related, it would be worth redoing a test like this just to see where you are. And I, I mean, that's what I'll often say to a patient is, they'll say, well, you know, I, I was diagnosed with such and such asthma or COPD or whatever. And I say, okay, well, good. Let's, let's just see where you are now. Because none of us are in the same place we were a year ago or five years ago, which is a good thing. Um, but but no, your body physiologically just changes so much over time. And then you throw on top of that another diagnosis like myositis. And that can really change the number. So, I think it's pretty reasonable to kind of get a sense of where things are. And maybe your doctor would repeat them, your numbers would look totally great, and they'd say, okay, great, then we maybe don't need to look at this again for another year or a couple of years, or if your symptoms change. So that's how I would, that's sort of how I would approach it. And I think, yes, ma'am. Is there any breathing, is there any breathing exercise that you can recommend yeah. to improve? Yeah, so um, we are really big proponents. As you've heard here, we are really big proponents of rehab. And so we have actually a program that's called Pulmonary Rehab, which is essentially um, a program that is 
designed for people who have lung issues, and it is a balanced exercise, so it does upper extremity as well as lower extremity. The reason we do that is because upper extremities help strengthen intercostal muscles, which are the chest muscles that you use to breathe if your diaphragm isn't working as well. And it also uses the concept that if your oxygen level is making it hard for you to do your exercise, so let's say when you're, you're somebody, when you walk around, your oxygen level drops in your blood, well, that's built into it. They'll put an oxygen mask on you so you can exercise. So the point is to not let the lung disease limit what you're able to do physically um, just on the basis of your muscle disease. And, and so we're very big proponents of that. And I think if I could wave my old magic wand and fix one thing in the healthcare system, that would be the one thing I would do because it is a low cost investment that has a lot of benefit. It's one of the very few things we've found in interstitial lung disease that not only include, improves people's functional level, it improves their quality of life. And there aren't a lot of things we do as doctors that actually improve people's quality of life. So I am a very big proponent of pulmonary rehab. So is that available here or like to anybody? So it would be somebody you would be referred by your physician, and you have to meet certain criteria in terms of these pulmonary function testing. But if you have restrictive lung disease or interstitial lung disease, you're typically going to qualify for it. So we have it here in the cities. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And if you have any questions, there's a wonderful website, which is called AACVPR.org, which is the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab, AACVPR. And it has a list of all of the different rehab sites. And I believe, and I haven't looked at it recently, but in the past they also had videos you could buy if it turned out that you were not in a community that had a pulmonary rehab program. They actually had videos that you could purchase, and then you would be able to use that to kind of guide you in your exercise, maybe in your in your home community. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, speaking of rehab, um, have you had any or known of any studies that um, have shown that diaphragmatic breathing and practicing diaphragmatic breathing has improved lung capacity? Because I have interstitial lung disease and I practice it almost mm -hmm. every day. Yeah. And last time I was at the doctor, she goes, oh, I don't even hear any crackling. So, yeah. I mean, that's easy for someone to learn, I feel, yeah. if you could do that. So, you know, one of the things you've heard from practically everybody who's spoken here is that we have so much we need to learn. Like, we know, we know a fraction of all the things we'd like to learn. And there's definitely a, there are definitely a large group of people who are very interested in understanding you know, what, is, what, what is the most efficient way to have, for people to have rehab? What is the most efficient kind of physical therapy for achieving certain endpoints? I mean, you even heard it this morning where they were talking about Pilates. And one person said, oh yeah, Pilates is great because it helps you maintain core. And then someone else said, yeah, but don't forget, you also have to exercise other, other parts of yourself. So I think that um, all of the, the things that teach you control of breathing, so the mindful large breath, as you say, the diaphragmatic breathing, they're very beneficial. They're not going to help other things, but as a part of an overall regimen, I think it would be a great thing to do. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that. OK, let me go on just a couple more slides, and then I'll answer any other questions that you have. OK, so um, one of the questions that I sometimes ask is, is like, why is it important to actually know if somebody has an interstitial lung disease? You know, you have your, maybe you're diagnosed with um, autoimmune myositis and you've got all these issues related to autoimmune myositis. Why does it actually matter? Why does it actually matter to know this? And, and so, um, one of the things that we're very concerned about is that for people who develop the muscle symptoms of myositis before they develop the lung symptoms, it can sometimes be really hard to figure out that you're short of breath if you're quite weak. So we've definitely had patients who present with very profound muscle weakness, and it took them you know, weeks or months before we realized there's also an intrinsic lung problem because they were so weak they just weren't moving around enough to get out of breath. And, and we, we think that the earlier you intervene on interstitial lung disease, the better the likelihood of a good outcome. So we don't like to come in and, and deal with it after you know, weeks or months of symptoms, we'd really like to deal with it within days to a week of symptoms. 
Um, interstitial lung disease is functions independently of muscle and skin. And this is something that has been really kind of really starkly shown in our myositis cohort where um, I may have a colleague, you know I'm working at Hopkins, so I'm with a whole bunch of people who you've probably heard speak before, but Lisa Christopher Stein might have a patient who she's treating for the muscle disease, and she may say, hey, great, you know, your muscle strength is so much better. And the person says, you know, yeah, you know, that's great, except now I notice I'm short of breath when I'm walking around. So the lung doesn't always go with the muscles in the skin. It sometimes pops up before or after. Similarly, you might have found, if you have dermatomyositis, that sometimes when it, muscles are doing great, all of a sudden the skin breaks out again, so the rash comes back. So things have to be managed independently. And what we always say is because the lungs are, they're not very forgiving of injury. And so treatment decisions should generally be driven by the lung disease. So if your muscles are strong but your lungs are still involved, we need to be treating you aggressively. It's not good enough that your muscles are strong. We've got to get the lung under control also. And the other really important thing is that this is actually a very life-threatening complication of, of autoimmune myositis, and it's often life-limiting. And so it needs to be the thing that drives therapy if there's any sense that that's part of what's going on. And I, I have to say that a lot of times I get calls from my colleagues saying, you know, um, my patient looks great, and their muscle strength is better, and their CK K is better, but they're short of breath, so what's going on? And then we have to really step back and say, okay, are the medications appropriate? Is the dosing appropriate? Do we need to add something in? So we really change therapy if we think the lung disease is not involved. So what does it mean to have interstitial lung disease? How does it change people's lives? Some of you all unfortunately already know this. <clears throat> But it's very different for every person. I think that the, one of the most important things to know is that medication often helps. This is a part of interstitial of, of myositis that I anticipate will get better when I treat patients. My goal is improvement, not just stabilization. It's getting them better. It sometimes means oxygen. When that diffusing capacity gets too low and the lung is less efficient in bringing in oxygen from the air, we sometimes need to help the lung out by adding supplemental oxygen. And it always needs pulmonary rehab. But as I've learned from my patients, where there's a will, there's a way. This is a patient I took care of very early in my career, and he was a very avid golfer. And he came into me one day, he said, Dr. Danoff, I am so excited. I have figured out how to play golf. If I just throw my oxygen tube over my shoulder, and I put my tank behind me, I can swing. And I'm not quite as good as I used to be, but I'm still pretty good. And, and so the key is that. We need to have everybody try to achieve the things they want to do. You know, if it's, if it's going to play golf, it's going out to see your kids or your grandkids playing games, or if it's going on a trip, all of those things are the things we need to work towards, not just from a myositis standpoint, but from a lung standpoint as well. And so that's really what we're trying to achieve here. All right, that is really all that I had to say and I'm just going to leave you with this. This is one of my favorite things, question everything. And I think that that is, you've heard lots of reasons why that should be your, your theme statement from this conference. And I'll just end. This is where I call home. This is Johns Hopkins. This is the oldest part of the hospital. It's called the Dome. And some of you, if you're familiar with um, the medical term of rounding, that term came from the fact that both the patients and the doctors lived in this building many, many, many years ago. And all of the, the rooms were set up around this central area. And so they would walk around the room, around the central area, to see the patients. And so that's where the term rounding comes from. So, all right, let me answer a few questions. Uh, um, actually, OK, we'll start right here. Yes. OK, thank you. Um, it looks like a lot of the symptoms are look like heart disease as well, and I'm wondering if, um, like, a cardiologist would be familiar with this thing with interstitial lung disease. Yeah, because I have, um, I mean, I have this disease, DM, but I also have um, cardiovascular disease in yeah. my family. So yeah, no, I, I mean, what you're saying is absolutely right. Part of the problem is that this isn't something that's going to come out and smack you in the face. It is very subtle. 
and there's a lot of reasons why people are short of breath. And so often what I hear is, you know, I thought I was a little short of breath, and first I, you know, went to my doctor and they gave me a couple rounds of, you know, antibiotics for, you know, for bronchitis, and then I went to my cardiologist and they did a stress test, and then finally somebody really put a stethoscope on my chest and they heard I had crackles and then they sent me for a, a chest x-ray or a CT. So there is a lot of delay in diagnosis because for exactly the reason you just mentioned, cough and shortness of breath and fatigue could be just about anything. You know, I also had a chest x-ray Yeah, I would, I would generally recommend if there's concern in the context, especially of, of a autoimmune myositis, right. that you have a high-resolution chest CT scan done. What's it called? A high-resolution chest CT scan. And that's done without contrast. So you don't need to have an IV put in. They don't need to ask you for contrast allergic. You just have it plain. What you should do, they should say to you, take a big deep breath and hold it, and they will whip you through this thing that looks like a giant donut. It should take maybe 25 seconds. So please try to hold your breath while you go through because if it's still, we get much better pictures. Yes, ma'am. I have um, dermatomyositis and ILD. My rheumatologist put me on tacrolimus mm -hmm. to get um, my lungs under control. And um, I was sent to a new pulmonologist and he said, what? Mm -hmm. Tacrolimus, which is an anti um, organ rejection medicine. Yeah, all of these are. Yeah, yeah. and so, um, and he said, what? You should be on Celsept, and so um, he's on the team with my rheumatologist. I went back to her, and she said, you know, this is working, and it's great, and, and he had never yeah. heard of it before. So my question is, have you heard of it? Oh, yeah. Is that common? Oh, well, I wouldn't say it's common, but I would say it is definitely in the, the, the sort of the top three choices for what are called steroids-bearing medicines. <laughs> So generally, many of you will, if you've experienced this, you might have been given a big dose of prednisone up front, and then they'll add a second drug, it might be Imuran or Celsept, and then often if those don't work, we'll go to tacrolimus, or if you have certain antibody types, we might go to tacrolimus first. They're, they're all doing the same thing. Their job is to lower the immune system, because remember how I was talking about the fact that these immune cells, these inflammatory cells, they just come in and they just devastate the lung. So what those medicines are meant to do is to just lower the immune system reaction, give the lung a chance to heal. And so it doesn't really matter which, which type you use. I, I, I don't know if any of you, do any of you know Arya Fisher from Denver? So Arya is a uh, rheumatologist and we spend a lot of time talking to each other. And so, um, so I, I likened it to like, it, it's like you grow up and you learn that your mother's chicken soup is the best chicken soup. And so if you grow up in a chicken soup house that uses cell set, that's the best one. If you grow up in an Imuran household, then Imuran's the best one. And Tacro is, I think, increasingly being used because we recognize that it helps patients who are not helped by uh, either cell set or Imuran. And so it is really kind of dealer's choice. We actually just published a paper that looked at patients who had come to Hopkins, and we looked at whether one of these drugs, Celsept or, or Imuran, was better. And we found that they basically are identical in terms of what they do. Some people can't tolerate one of the drugs. It might cause them upset stomach or it might cause their liver enzymes to rise. So then we switch to the other one. And sometimes if they can't tolerate either or they don't, they don't do well with it, we might switch them to tacrolimus. I have plenty of patients on Tacro. And the only thing that is different about Tacro is that you get Tacro levels where we don't tend to get levels for either the Imuran or the Celsept. And that's the only, from my perspective, that's the only difference is remembering to have people get their Tacro levels done. Yes, Lisa. Um, yeah, so if you have intercostal muscle involvement, um, I know you'll have like pain probably because you have nerves within a region, but would, you, would that show up on the MRI? The inflammation of intercostal? That's a great question. You know, we've been really interested because we're interested when somebody comes in with restrictive lung disease, that is when their lungs are small and they have myositis, we want to really quickly figure out is it a muscle problem or is it a lung problem? And so actually part of the research we're doing right now is trying to reanalyze um, the imaging data we have to see if we can figure out whether you can measure the muscles that are involved in breathing. And so 
I don't have the answer for you right now, but I hope I'm gonna have that answer for you in maybe a year or two, because again, you know, what I have said on a number of occasions is the thing I would most like to do is the first time you walk into my office, I'd like to tell you, here's what you have to expect. Not here are the many things you have to expect, but this is what is going to happen for you. This is the best drug for you. This is the next step. And what we're doing right now is it's more like you're going to, you know, you're going to the store and you're trying on five pairs of Levi's jeans to find the one that fits perfectly. That's all those different types of, of um, immunosuppressants we're using. We want to send you to the right dressing room the very first time, so you put on the right pair of jeans the first time. All right, there are many hands up. Yes, ma'am. Is there a connection between using straws and aspiration pneumonia? Are there oh, other wow. things that you can suggest wow. to I, not do? That is I've had a doctor <coughs> recommend not using straws because you use your lungs to suck in the liquid. I, you know, I actually, I, I'm embarrassed to say I have never thought about that. And I know the person who will know the answer, who is my colleague, Tay Chung, who is our PM&R person. And I'm sure he knows the answer, but I'm afraid I do not know. But I will ask him. I had a pulmonary function test, and with it came a graph that was uh, like a cross graph, and then it had a circle on it where I was over here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, that's remained steady for two years. But I don't know what that meant. That's, yeah, that's a slow volume loop. And so um, when I show you this one, um, this, is, this is showing just the numbers that are extracted from that loop. And so we generally, when we look at these tests, they're actually all derived from that circle that you're telling me about. That top part is when, you, is when you blow out, and the bottom part is when you inhale. And that's what's called a flow volume loop. And all of these numbers just are, this is how high did that loop go? What's the maximum volume on that loop? This one is what was your volume when you one second had gone by? So it's just a way of taking the data from that loop and putting it into numbers. We had a bunch of hands up here, so I don't know. I guess, <coughs> not my question. Okay, so I'm just going to, I've had a lot of doctors tell me that the intercostal muscles and diaphragm have nothing to do with polymyositis. And I'm having severe, like, apnea spells because they just burn and get tired. So from what I'm hearing this week is, they're Mus not right. Muscles are muscles. I mean, I'm, you, you probably heard um, a little bit of the discussion of this idea of proximal versus distal muscles. So, so people who have um, people who have IBM, inclusion body myositis, have more impact on the, the distal muscles, the ones out by the fingers and the toes first. And people who have autoimmune myositis typically have things that are closer to the trunk, so their shoulders their hips, but the neck muscles are some of the ones that are affected, and the diaphragm is definitely affected, and the intercostal muscles are also affected. So everything really in the kind of the central part of your body can be affected by it. The thing is that the intercostal muscles, they're, they're usually there just to, to be backup. So we don't tend to use, if you're just breathing quietly and nothing's going on, you're mostly just using your diaphragm. When you're working, when you're running, when you're under stress, that's when those intercostal muscles are working. But what we can do is sometimes the difference between the diaphragm and a lot of other muscles is you can lie still and all your other muscles stop moving. The diaphragm never stops moving because you're constantly breathing. And so it sometimes doesn't recover as well from myositis as some of the other muscles do. And that's why we use the intercostals because we can recruit intercostals to help compensate for a diaphragm that isn't working quite as well. And so that's why we like people to do upper extremity strengthening as well as doing like 
like aerobic exercise, which usually involves your legs, we like people to do an arm bike, to do weight lifting, to do something that involves their arms, because again, we're trying to recruit more of these upper extremity and intercostal muscles. Um, I have dermatomyositis and interstitial lung disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, the DM presented after a trip to the hair salon. I did hair coloring. That's when everything flared. So what I'm wondering is about chemical exposure. I, I moved into a townhouse six years ago. And it was a fire rehab. The entire mm -hmm. thing was gutted. Everything was sealed. But the attached garage was not. Mm -hmm. And so recently, just accidentally, I found out that the air from the garage is coming into the house. Mm -hmm. Put on mothballs, and now I realize that the smell is coming in. But now I'm wondering, could, would you say that that could be a trigger? So you're asking a really important question. We've all alluded to the fact that we think that there is probably there are probably triggers, and there's probably a susceptible genetic environment that allows it to happen. But the reality is, we do not understand most of what causes this. So, um, for instance. This winter, I had two young patients come in with rip-roaring dermatomyositis after a documented influenza infection. I'm pretty sure the influenza infection was somehow related to them getting dermatomyositis, but we don't know this in any very direct way. There is a doctor who's at NIEHS, National Institute of Environmental Health and Safety, NIEHS, which is part of the NIH, and his name is Fred Miller. And Fred is doing a study called MyoRisk. And MyoRisk is intending to try to identify environmental components that are potentially involved in triggering myositis. So he's collecting people who have just been diagnosed with myositis and doing environmental surveys. So vacuuming people's houses and collecting the dust particles and analyzing the dust to see what's in it. And also asking a very extensive history of things you might have been in contact with. And so I hope we'll have the answer to that, but at the moment we don't, there are only a very few things we know are clearly triggers. And, and most of the things we can only guess at, and we don't have any specific knowledge. What would you say the most common triggers are? So I will tell you that the best example of a trigger, and I'm, I'm getting ready to get pulled off the stage with the, with the hook in a second. The best example is actually work that my colleague Andy Mammon at the NIH did showing that there are people who take statin medications who develop myositis after they're exposed to statins because they develop an antibody to the cholesterol receptor. And so that is the best example of a direct connection between the presence of an autoimmune disease and an autoimmune myositis and a trigger, that being the statin. But the vast majority of people, we don't know what their trigger is. We can guess at it, but we don't know what it is. So it's a great question. I, am, I, am I being shut down, Dale? No, I get one more. Okay. Um, I have polymyositis, among other autoimmune uh, diseases, and I'm on 2,000 milligrams of salsa and five of prednisone, but um, I noticed that I've had this cough for like three and a half weeks. It's not going away, mm -hmm. and dizziness and all the other mm -hmm. stuff. So. Um, so can you still get it even though I'm on this dose of self? So some people do end up developing it, but the other thing you have to remember is that when you're on those medicines so that uh, suppress your immune system, you're also much more susceptible to infection. So I definitely go back to your doctor, have them swab you, see if you're infected. We've got we've had a huge outbreak of what's called rhinovirus, which is a common cold virus, but it is very tough on patients who have autoimmune disease. So we can pick that up if they actually do a nasal swab on you. Oh, this has to be a nasal, because they did one for strep. Yeah, that's not strep. usually the thing that does it. It's usually a virus. So okay. ask them to swab your nose. Not the best, most fun activity, but still very valuable. <laughs> okay, thanks. Anyways, I think I'm being shut down by my, my dear colleague here. One more? Okay. Yeah. You didn't have ILD, you know, early on in your diagnosis of DM, and you, the longer you go, is that um, uh, is your chances lower that you'll get later in life? Yep, it is lower, but it's not zero. Yeah, I know. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not like like taxes. It's not. It's not a certainty. Thank you all so much for being here. I appreciate your questions, and if there are any other questions, I'm happy to. Stay.